prepare to have your health questions answered here on Safe, Effective, Natural Solutions with Dr. Todd Binkley, owner of Binkley Healing Center in downtown Ventura. Now, here's Dr. Todd. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Todd Bankley, board-certified non-force doctor of chiropractic and practitioner of functional medicine. Last week, we talked a lot about diabetes, and I had a couple of questions come in about that. Uh, one of them was, you know, why, why does this happen? Why is it so difficult to deal with this? Why is it so difficult to get off this massive consumption of grain, starch, and sugar? Well, sugar is an addiction, You know, if you consume something that causes you to immediately crave more of it, that is an addiction. And the neurochemical pathways in your brain that cause sugar to be such an entrenched addiction are the same pathways that underlie the addictions to things like heroin and cocaine. It's a serious thing. It's very difficult to break that. There are ways to do it, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We're going to talk about another great case, a diabetic case, so an unusual diabetic case, a skinny man. A, a lot of times diabetics are overweight. This guy didn't look diabetic, and you know he looked actually pretty fit and pretty healthy, but he had severe diabetes, was very concerned about it, uh, drove a couple of hours to get to my office because he heard I could help him, and we did. So we'll, go, we'll come back to that a bit later. So why are starchy foods, grains, starch, and sugar? You notice I, instead of saying carbohydrates, everyone talks about carbs all the time. You know, we do need carbs in your diet. I recommend diabetics eat almost no quote-unquote carbs, but even that's not true. I recommend they eat almost no grains, starch, and sugar. What's the difference? There's carbs. There are carbohydrates in broccoli and spinach and tomatoes and carrots and mushrooms and cauliflower and, you know, delicious, healthy vegetables, delicious if you know how to prepare them properly. And so everyone, uh, if they eat almost any food, nuts have carbohydrates in them. So that's why it's more important to focus on reducing your consumption of grains, starch, and sugar. Reduce your, you're going to get plenty of carbohydrates from eating vegetables and nuts and seeds. Just don't eat so much bread, rice, starchy vegetables like potatoes and corn. Potatoes and corn aren't even really vegetables. They're just starch. And rice. Don't eat things that are that are you know, grains, starch, and sugar, like the worst sugars are the liquid sugars in beer, fruit juices, soda, sweet cocktails, sweet wine, anything that's liquid and sweet spikes your blood sugar the worst. When someone is passed out on the floor from a hypoglycemic you know, passed out from hypoglycemia, what's the first thing you, you give them? Orange juice, right? Because that'll immediately spike their blood sugar and bring it back up into a safe level. Well, think about that. Do you think you should be drinking orange juice every morning if it's really that good at spiking your blood sugar? You don't want to ever spike your blood sugar unless you have hypoglycemia. So no, it's orange juice is not good for you. No fruit juice is good for you. If you want to get the nutrients, the antioxidants, and the wonderful vitamins that are in fruit, eat the fruit. If you eat fruit, then the time it takes to chew the food and swallow it and break the starch down in the or the fiber down in the fruit slows the absorption of the sugar in it. And there are some fruits that are so sweet that I even recommend most people don't eat those. You know, the most people's favorite fruits are the sweetest ones. The worst fruits, if you're especially if you're pre-diabetic, are grapes, oranges, melons, uh, anything that's super sweet. You know, those are those are going to spike your blood sugar. So the good fruits that are worth the sugar that are in them because they're packed with antioxidants and other nutrients are berries. So blueberries, raspberries, boysenberries, blackberries, even strawberries, especially small wild strawberries instead of the big, huge, juicy ones that everyone likes. Everyone likes the sweetest possible fruit. So eat fruit that's less sweet, that's packed with nutrients like blueberries and raspberries if you're going to have fruit. So I kind of got off on a little tangent there. Why is it that these things are so addictive? Well, let's look at the history of our digestive systems. The primary cause of death for our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago was starvation. Hunter-gatherers had to spend most of their time just finding food, and they would have to survive long periods of famine. So we evolved the ability to store carbs, store carbohydrates as fat to survive periods of famine. 
And it takes a long time. Now we live in a, an environment where we're surrounded by food. We're never, no one's st- very well. Most people in the Western world, at least, are not going to starve for lack of food. But we haven't had a t- enough time on a, on the time scale that it takes for our genes to change and our our physiology to change to overcome this this predisposition to st- store carbs as fat to survive famine. We're still doing that. Our basic metabolism has been around for about 2 million years. And for the first 1.9 million years, there were no pancakes, no bagels, no bread, no pasta, no orange juice, no Cheerios. Dinner, for most of our physiological existence, has been mainly meat, fish, veggies, fruit, and dairy. So about 10,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution created cheap calories on a massive scale. For the first time, we could we could grow wheat and potatoes and corn and rice and other starches that would store for months or even years. And that allowed people to not have to spend all their time searching for food and instead settle down in cities and create musical instruments and write symphonies and, you know, whole cultures sprung up. And a lot of uh, what we credit now with civilization was a result of that ability to, to grow starch, store it, and have it available for anyone to eat. But the problem with that is the very first grain-based diets also fueled the development of modern disease. Thousands of years ago, ancient Egyptians ate mostly stone ground, whole wheat bread, fruit and vegetables, occasional meat, olive, safflower, flaxseed, and sesame oils. Well, when they did studies on these mummies and compared them, thousands of mummies were compared to the remains of hunter-gatherer societies that preceded them. The Egyptians had a shorter lifespan, more heart disease and clogged arteries, and more prevalent obesity, particular abdominal obesity the worst kind. So insulin is a fat storage hormone. It's stimulated by consuming excess carbohydrates and aggressively promotes the accumulation of body fat. Insulin simultaneously tells your body to not release any stored fat for energy and it convinces you that you need more starch to store as more fat. It makes you hungry. Excess insulin from eating too many grain, starch, and sugar causes an insulin hit. Your insulin use your body over time. Your body puts out too much insulin, which causes your blood sugar to go too low. That's when you get the crash in the mid-morning and think you need a sugary snack or more coffee or in the middle of the afternoon. After eating too much starch and sugar, it depresses your blood sugar, which causes you to feel ravenous. It causes you to feel hungry and moody and shaky, and ready to crash all the time, which creates intense cravings for more sugar, more carbs. So carb addiction tricks us into thinking that we need lots of this stuff. And I'm going to come back to this. It also feeds bad bacteria in your gut, which also helps feed that addiction. We'll come back to that. So grain starches and sugar also disrupt the hormonal system your brain uses to manage your appetite. Fat cells produce a hormone called leptin, that tells your brain to release fat. Bad carbs make your brain resistant to leptin, just like all your cells become resistant to insulin over time. So your brain thinks you're starving. This also creates and contributes to carb addiction. So if you're experiencing cravings, cutting back a little bit won't break the addiction. Eating a little less bad carbs is a lot like doing a little less heroin. It's not going to change anything. The only way to restore proper function to your appetite hormones is to temporarily, not forever, temporarily eliminate grains, starch, and sugar from your diet to force your body to burn fat for energy again. Most people have heard of keto diets. This is a big part of that. Eating lots of vegetables during this process so that you feel full after each meal also helps reset your hormones. So don't do this at home. Don't do this on your own. Don't just suddenly stop eating grain, starch, and sugar altogether unless you get tested 
and you know what, um, you know, how your kidneys are functioning and if you're, you know, everyone's situation is different. So I don't recommend doing this unless you get tested first. But I, one of the ways, the main way that I have helped people reverse and eliminate diabetes completely is by for about three to four months, usually four months, completely eliminating grains, starch, and sugar to break the cravings. I'm Dr. Todd Bankley discussing with you safe, effective, natural solutions to almost any health challenge. We're focusing again a little bit today on diabetes, and then we're going to talk about the microbiome. But before we finish on diabetes, know your risk factors. So the greatest risk factors in America in the Western world for diabetes is just being over age 45. Almost everybody Over age 45, especially over 50, is at high risk uh, that eats the standard American diet. If you're overweight, if you have a family history of diabetes or cardiovascular disease, if you have high blood pressure, if you've been tested and know that you have high triglycerides, your body converts all that starch and sugar into triglycerides in your bloodstream, which wreaks havoc throughout your bloodstream, increasing inflammation and aggravating every chronic inflammatory disease, high triglycerides then get stored as adipose tissue. So that's the process of consuming sugar that you're not going to eat, becomes triglycerides floating around your bloodstream, wreaking havoc, and then gets turned into fat cells. So men with a waist size of 40 inches or more are 12 times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. Risk is tripled for 36 to 38 inch waists, waists, and five times greater for 38 to 40 inch waists, as compared to a waist of 34 inches or smaller. Well, I feel just fine, you might say, even if you are over 45 or 50 or have some of the risk factors I just mentioned. Well, so insulin resistance and pre-diabetes usually have no symptoms. You can have insulin resistance and pre-diabetes. Millions of people have pre-diabetes and don't know it. You can have one or both for several years without noticing anything. So listen to last week's episode of my show where I talk about the importance of doing fasting insulin testing. Most doctors don't do this. If you test your fasting insulin levels and see if they'll start to go up long before your blood sugar will go up, long before your A1C will go up. Get that tested and make sure it is in a healthy range and uh, contact me for more information about this. So we're going to talk about the microbiome now. And it's a great segue because sugar wreaks havoc on your microbiome. The bad bacteria in your gut love sugar. When you eat grain, starch, and sugar, it feeds the bad bacteria and gives them the upper hand to overwhelm the good bacteria that make everything work. You know, we have roughly 10 times as many bacteria in our intestines as we have cells in our body, and we depend on them for our survival. We depend on healthy bacteria to break down and absorb nutrients. We depend on healthy bacteria to break down and eliminate toxins that we're constantly exposed to. We depend on them to uh, combat inflammation. We we depend on healthy bacteria in the gut to regulate our moods. The the gut-brain connection has to do with this profound interplay between the uh, benefits of healthy bacteria in your gut mediated through the the hardwired connection between your gut and the brain is the vagus nerve that goes from the base of your brain all the way down to your intestines. And this system is profound and there's more research coming out on it all the time. Disruptions in your microbiome, Had too many bad bacteria, not enough good bacteria cause and dramatically increase your risk of anxiety, depression, Alzheimer's, and all forms of dementia, Parkinson's disease, obsessive compulsive disorder. If you listen to one of my previous podcasts, I talk about where I attended a four-day integrative medicine for mental health conference. And it was every single presenter mentioned something about the, the damaging effects of sugar on the microbiome and the increased risks of almost every psychiatric disorder by consuming too much grains, starch, and especially sugar. So how do you know if your microbiome has has a problem? Well, if it's bad, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, gas, bloating, these things are not normal. If they happen once a year because you ate something unusual, okay, but if it's happening every month, every week, several times a week, 
There's a classic sign of a disrupted microbiome. The gas and the bloating and the nausea and pain in your gut are produced by the metabolic waste of bad bacteria. Basically, their pee is toxins that cause, comprised of toxins that cause nausea, and they also produce the gas that, that give you gas. Flatulence and belching is gas produced by bad bacteria. If it's in your lower intestine, it's going to come out the lower end. If it's in the upper intestine, or especially in your stomach, it's going to cause belching. So how do you repair this? Well, there's a number of things you could do. Number one, eat better food. Don't eat a lot of grain starch and sugar, obviously. But also it helps to eat vegetables, eat fiber. And the best place you can get fiber is from vegetables like spinach and broccoli and cauliflower and carrots and mushrooms and leafy greens. So don't eat a salad. And well, what if you're still hungry? What if a salad, some people say, oh, a salad never fills me up? Well, the best way to fill yourself up with vegetables and the way I do it is think of it like this. Make a salad for four people in a big bowl and then eat it. Eat the whole thing yourself. That will fill you up. And a lot of people hate salads or just, you know, don't ever make time, don't eat enough of them because they don't know how to make a good salad. The worst way to make a salad is the way most people make salads, by going to a salad bar or just chopping up a bunch of iceberg lettuce or chop up a bunch of vegetables and throw them in a bowl and toss them and then pour some goop on top like ranch dressing or Italian dressing or some other kind of dressing. No, don't do that. The best way to make a delicious salad is to first put your greens in your bowl, especially some good greens like spinach and mixed Asian greens and butter lettuce or kale if you know how to prepare it properly. Kale is tail tastes terrible if you don't know how to make it properly. I'll come back to that at some point. But take whatever greens that you're going to use as the base of your salad, put them in a huge bowl and drizzle some good olive oil, not the cheap stuff from the supermarket, but good olive oil from farmer's market or a local supplier that get, makes fresh olive oil right here in California. But drizzle it with good olive oil and either some lemon or balsamic vinegar, and then toss your greens in the oil and vinegar so that they're evenly coated with oil and vinegar and maybe just a little bit of salt and pepper. And then put all the rest of the stuff on top and don't toss it. Put all the... You know, some nuts, some tomatoes, some olives, maybe some little chunks of cheese, some chicken, some turkey, some smoked salmon, some leftover sautéed mushrooms, some leftover sautéed vegetables, whatever, whatever you like. Just put that on top and don't toss it because then it's just going to end up on the bottom. Put that on top and maybe drizzle a little bit more oil and squeeze a little bit more lemon or a little bit of balsamic vinegar, a little bit of salt and pepper, and then you'll have a delicious salad. Or... Cook your vegetables. Get more fiber by cooking vegetables. And most people don't know how to really cook vegetables that much either. How do you tell? If you're eating lots of them, then you probably know how to cook them well. If you're not, then you probably don't. And my favorite way to find out great new ways for to make vegetables delicious is to Google vegetarian recipes. Vegetarians have come up with amazing ways to make vegetables delicious. So then do that and then make that vegetarian recipe even more delicious by adding a little chicken to it or a little fish, a little prosciutto, a little ham, a little tiny little bit of bacon. That's my favorite way to make vegetarian dishes delicious with apologies to the vegetarians. So eat a big salad for lunch every day. That's a great way to prevent inflammation and dysbiosis, bad bacteria in your gut taking over the good bacteria. But what if you're already, you know, what if it's already too late? You've got gas, bloating, nausea, cramping, you know, you've got some indigestion, something's going on in your stomach, it's not good. You know, you probably need to kill off the bad bacteria. So number one, stop feeding them with sugar, but you can also kill them directly with natural things like garlic and onions, rosemary oil, oregano, oregano oil, wormwood, berberine, monolaurin. This is one of my favorite things to give lots of people, almost anybody with a, even a slight gut condition. It's a great monolaurin is in human breast milk and it helps set up your immune system when you're born and then you basically never get it again. But monolaurin, this is it's an essential fatty acid. It's a very stable nutrient. Most people have never heard of it. It's in a product called loracidin. So loracidin, monolaurin, is made from coconuts. Now, the first thing people think, oh, I'll, eat, I'll drink coconut water, I'll eat some coconut, I'll do coconut, the coconut oil. There is no consumable 
coconut food or drink that has any significant amount of monolaurin in it. You can't get any significant amount of it from eating or drinking any of those foods made from coconuts. You can get it by taking the supplement Laura Seedon, which is an amazing product. It's not expensive. A jar of it costs about $37 with tax and lasts for months. And it's a natural antibacterial, antiviral, antiparasitical, and antifungal nutrient that helps your body kill all of kill off all of these things without any side effects. You can give it to newborn infants. And then of course the best way to kill off bad bacteria is to support the good bacteria. So you can support good bacteria with prebiotics. And a lot of people get confused about prebiotics and probiotics. What's the difference? Well probiotics are the good bacteria that we've been talking about. Prebiotics are food for probiotics. They're food that support good bacteria. So prebiotics are things like in, or the fiber we already talked about, but also inulin, which you can supplement or get from foods like garlic, onions, leeks, and asparagus. You can also supplement digestible fibers like oligosaccharides. And then there's a whole host and some really excellent products to help support the good bacteria that are all basically based on combinations of antioxidants. So the master antioxidant is glutathione. And there are a couple of ways to supplement glutathione. I don't recommend buying most glutathione supplements because most of them don't work. You basically need your body to get better at making glutathione on its own. Glutathione is made um, from three amino acids. The first two are abundant in your diet. The third one uh, cysteine is not available. Cysteine is the is the missing link that, that your body usually lacks sufficient amounts to make its own glutathione, and you can supplement that. A lot of people supplement with N-acetylcysteine. There's a really excellent excellent product called Immunocal, which is a special processed form of a gently no heat, no agitation processed form of whey protein that is an excellent cysteine donor. And I've actually done blood tests before and after a case study to show how this particular product uh, dramatically increases uh, glutathione levels. Other antioxidants, there are combination products that you can get with uh, powdered form, you know, and easy to take to get some the antioxidants in blueberries, pomegranate, cranberries, quercetin, broccoli, red grape, all in one product. There's another one that I like from a company called Designs. That, that is, that's a one from a product called Phytobiome from Designs for Health. I also often use a similar product from uh, orthomolecular products called Phytopre, which is pomegranate and citrus bioflavonoids. So you can also always add more good bacteria by eating fermented foods like yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, and kombucha. And then if necessary, supplement with a good probiotic. So probiotics are good bacteria in a capsule or a powder. And I always stress a good probiotic. Don't buy cheap probiotics from Costco or Trader Joe's or your local pharmacy. They don't work. The most, ex the most expensive supplement and biggest waste of money you'll ever waste money on is buying a supplement that does nothing. So good probiotics, when you need them, do wonders. And cheap probiotics usually do nothing. Then the last thing you can do is combat the inflammation that occurs when you have too many bad bacteria and not enough good bacteria. So you can clear out the inflammatory debris from a chronically, chronically inflamed gut and stop the processes that result in your gut being inflamed with things like zinc carnosine and various herbs like turmeric, Chinese skullcap, ginger, green tea, and also, again, there's so many benefits from eating garlic and onions. Just eat, I eat a head or sometimes two heads of garlic every week. And, you know, the best onions, my favorite kinds of onions are green onions, scallions, chives, or shallots. My favorite onions are shallots because they're small. You cut up one shallot, it's about the size of a golf ball. It's, you know, you buy these huge sweet onions, they have much less of these uh, beneficial properties in them than shallots. Shallots are delicious and, you know, you don't waste anything. You cut up one shallot, that's about the amount that you need for, for one meal. 
Looks like we're out of time. Remember to do something to be healthier this week than you were last week. Check out past episodes of this show on my website, BinkleyHealingCenter.com. I look forward to speaking with you right here next Friday at 4 p.m. Have a fantastic weekend. You've been listening to Safe, Effective, Natural Solutions with Dr. Todd Binkley. If you have a health question you want discussed on the show, email your health questions to Dr. Binkley at BinkleyHealingCenter.com. Take advantage of this opportunity to ask questions for yourself and for your loved ones because our health matters. Join him next Friday at 4 p.m. for safe, effective, natural solutions right here on 98.3 The Word, KDAR.